Amen. If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 45. Next Sunday, we have the privilege of hearing from Dr. Chris Nanakin from Bangalore, India. Although he is living here and many of you know him, he'll be preaching both Sunday morning and and Sunday evening. In the evening, he's going to be sharing with us how we can share Christ with an Asian, someone who comes from an Asian background with values and cultural values, to understand how we can reach them effectively. And that'll be in the evening. Don't miss out on that. If you pray for me, I will actually be in Dallas next Sunday speaking at Grace Bible at a missions conference there in the morning. And then I'll be speaking in the chapel at Dallas Theological Seminary on Tuesday. So if you would please pray for me that I'll be able to open God's word faithfully and to be able to challenge them to mission and remembering the glories of the gospel. When we think about the gospel, the gospel is a story, a narrative set in time and space. Set in a time that began really before anything was created. And we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit living together in perpetual harmony. Love In the beginning, there was God. Can you guys actually follow along with me? The clicker is not working this morning, or maybe it's turned, oh, it's off. <laughs> Let's try that again. It's amazing if you turn it on. Back, forward. Bear with me a minute, we're going to get this thing working. Okay. Is it working now? Great. Got the thumbs up. Okay. In the beginning, there was God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, living in harmony and love, needing no one, needing nothing, the great I am. And yet God creates. Why does he create? He does not create because he needs. He creates out of an overflow of his being. Because God is love, he wants to create so that others might share in his being. There is no other God, again, looking at character studies, like this God exhibited anywhere in the humanities or in the religions of the world. Every other God, gods or goddesses creates for self-serving reasons in anticipation of need or wanting worship. Whereas the God of the Bible needs nothing. He is completely self-satisfied in himself. So what prompts him to create? Simply love. To invite others who are not worthy to share in that love. Now God creates. He creates a perfect world free of flaw. And yet Adam and Eve sinned and brought sin into the world. Now lest we think that we would do something different. Every single day we as humans validate Adam and Eve's choice of sin with our own hearts and actions. We have sinned. We have separated ourselves from God, and yet God did not let go. And in the great moment of grace, God himself, in the second person of the Trinity, the Son, stepped down to the cross, living a perfect life, and took upon himself the wrath of God to pay the sin debt that you and I should have paid on the cross, and yet he did it again out of grace and Love, And this is indeed the core of the gospel, that anyone who believes in Christ and trusts in his sacrifice will be saved. And again, that is the the gateway to salvation. Trust and faith and belief that Christ said who he is, that he is who he said he was. And that he reigns, that he lives, that he paid our sacrifice. Now even though this is what we call the core of the gospel... It is not the end of the gospel. Matter of fact, the end of the gospel culminates in the second coming of Christ. What we call the parousia, the presence, the appearing of the Holy One. And when we talk about the gospel, it is critical that we understand that the gospel does not stop at the cross, but continues into the second coming and for all eternity. Salvation was purchased at the cross. The debt was paid at the cross. We are spiritually saved at the cross. But it is the second coming when our salvation will be fully realized. When sin and just injustice will be dealt with in its fullness. My Muslim friends, one of their biggest stumbling blocks is how could a God submit his son to such shame on the cross? And it's a valid question. But he did it out of love. And that's not the end of the story. 
Because when he comes again, he comes not in shame, but he will come in victory, power, and righteousness. And that is what Jesus talks about in Matthew 24. The clouds will part and out will come the Son of Man with the armies of heaven to gather his people together and to punish all injustice and to do away with all evil and sin. Jesus uses very stark imagery in Matthew 24, even invoking the the story of Noah with the great flood. That unless you're in the ark, you will be swept away by God's wrath on that day. And unless you are hid within the rock that is Christ in the lighthouse of our Savior, the waves will wash you away justly into an eternal hell. This photo by Jean Gouchard is one of my favorite photographs perhaps of all time because you look at the lighthouse keeper there off the coast of France and he's standing in complete serenity as the waves crash about him. Why? Because he's safe in the lighthouse. Now, actually, I I listened to an interview, and the man had no idea that the wave was coming, and when he saw it coming, he was terrified and shut the door. But that does away with my nice illustration, so stick with the first one. But the coming of Christ and his return, and the question that we all must ask is, are we hid within the rock do we encourage one another with, our, with these words? Do we recognize how significant the second coming is to Christian doctrine and to Christian hope? Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reminding us that the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. We should be talking about the fact that Jesus is coming. He continues and says, do you not remember? And again, he reminds us of the gospel, 1 Thessalonians 5, that God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, that rock in whom we hide. He who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, whether we live or die, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up with these words. Remind one another. Preach to yourself. Preach to others. Preach to your fellow believers the realities of the gospel. And that one day he's coming again. You know, even as we talk about soul hurts and wounds just a few moments ago, one of our hopes is that though we are broken now, we look forward to the day when we will be fully made whole. When the wounds and the hurts no longer hold sway over our life and we can say goodbye to sin and to fear and into insecurity and the sins of others that affect us forever. Because on that day, Jesus will make it all right. And that's good news, isn't it? Something to look forward to. It gives us hope. It gives us a north star by which to guide the ship of our life. This morning we're going to be looking at three parables. As Jesus works to make all things new, there are three parables that he gives that talk about the second coming of Christ. These three parables can be found in chapter 24, verse 45, all the way down to verse 30 of chapter 25. Now, you may not have a lot of knowledge of the Bible. I don't know your particular background or religious background. But parables are short stories that Jesus told. To illustrate simple truths. One thing we must be very careful in interpreting parables is not to allegorize them out of their context. To try and find some sort of esoteric hidden meaning in every illustration. But rather to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying and take away that main point of the parable. There are three lessons that we can learn in these parables. The three parables have to do with a servant, ten virgins... And the talents, which are a form of money. These three lessons for the parousia, the appearing, the the presence of Christ. The first parable, we learn the principle of accountability. That there are eternal consequences for the decisions made in this life. From the parable of the ten virgins, we learn the virtue and the value of expectancy. Expecting the imminent return of Christ and that true belief... True faith in Christ expects and prepares for the day of the Lord. The third parable, the talents, has to do with entrustment. That we will be called to answer for how we use the grace that was given to us. 
And no matter who you are, where you're from, God has indeed given you grace, favor that you don't deserve. And what have you done and what are you doing with that grace that has been given to you? Let's unpack this together, but first let us read God's word beginning in verse 45 down into chapter 25 of verse 30. A long passage, but stay with me. Verse 45, chapter 24. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, He will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master is delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Chapter 25, verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, and I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, You delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested in my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own and with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Pray with me. Father, I pray that you would make your word live to me as I preach it. Make it live to those who are listening. And may we heed its warnings and its truths. May we live in accordance with your word. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If we were honest... With our Western mindset of thinking, there are many things about these parables that seem excessive and don't make sense. That for a master to throw a servant into a place of the weeping and gnashing of teeth, simply because of money mismanagement, now is money mismanagement serious? Yes. Is it deserved of that level of punishment? We would probably, many of us, say that doesn't seem like the punishment fits the crime. Even when the, the servant in the third parable says, I hid it in the ground, and the master comes down on him and says, actually, 
cast a worthless servant into outer darkness because you didn't make me money. It doesn't make sense to the Western mind. So let us take a step back into the Middle Eastern mind. One of the important interpretational aspects of interpreting parables is to understand the dynamic of honor and shame and the importance of relationship in that culture. Here in the West, we define right and wrong by laws and by transgressions. And we interpret those infractions in light of those laws. Whereas in the Middle East, even today, the greatest evil is not the transgression of a law, but actually the breaking of a relationship. The bringing of a shame upon a family or a household. So much so that even acts that we would consider heinous, murder, rape, and to be clear, biblically these are heinous crimes. But in other parts of the world are viewed as how did it break a relationship and to what degree did honor and shame play into? How much shame was brought in? That is why sometimes murder is viewed as an okay in order to preserve the honor of the family involved. Now, don't misunderstand me. I am not giving a moral judgment here of what is right or wrong in every case. <laughs> murder is always wrong. We know that from the Ten Commandments. Rape is always wrong. The abuse of another brother is wrong. But you need to understand that the highest sin... The highest affront, the highest dishonor is the disregard of that sacred relationship. When we look at these three parables, what we see in each case are individuals who did not consider the master worthwhile, valuable, and as a result of their actions brought shame and personally offended and accosted the honor of the master or the virgins, the wedding ceremony. And that is the deepest insult, the deepest hurt that could be incurred. Matter of fact, in the, the parables, the disciples probably thought such actions would be unfathomable because of how significant the hurts are. It's very, these are very, very personal. Please understand, these are deeply personal parables. When a master sets the servant over the household, that is, that is a very personal interaction. And to breach that relationship is a deeply personal offense. To be invited into a marriage ceremony is, is a deeply honorable and personal invitation. And to disregard it is a deeply personal offense. For a master who would entrust servants with his resources and his worldly wealth and say, I am trusting you with the future inheritance of my son and my children, that was a great honor and a deeply personal entrustment. And to abuse that was a deeply personal offense. The first parable has to do with a servant. And from it we learn a lesson on accountability. That we have a servant who is called faithful and wise. And I should note that faithfulness in the Bible is perhaps one of the chiefest virtues of godliness. That faithfulness first describes our God, doesn't it? When we are unfaithful, he is faithful. He holds on even when we let go. He pursues even when we run away. He is a faithful God. And likewise, it is not the most talented. It is not the most gifted. It is not who has the biggest church or the most ministries or the most funds and the bank account in order to support missionaries. They, all of those have their rightful place. But the most important thing that God has, no matter who you are or what you have, is are you faithful with what you have? Are you a faithful servant? To be faithful invites the master to bestow a beatitude, a blessing on that servant, joy, honor, and commendation because the servant was living as if the master was present. I think about us and do we live as if the master is present like this faithful servant? Do we live in our closed doors in our homes or when the closet door is shut 
or as we're browsing the internet, or as we're engaging in those conversations and business deals, as we get up in the morning and plot our life and hours of the day, are all of those decisions controlled, living as if the master was right here? Do we live as if the master was present? Because this first servant, the wise one, did. We see here Jesus saying that blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. He is in the process of doing, even as the, the son returns in glory, that servant is faithful. When we think about the second coming of Christ, we're not called to gather on the top of a hill and twiddle our thumbs waiting for him to return. We're not called to remove ourselves into Christian communes and separate ourselves from the world. But rather we are called, yes, to be holy, but to be busy doing the mission that God has called us to so that when Jesus comes, may by God's grace he find Heritage Baptist Church full of people busy about the master's business. Not asleep. Not in drunkenness and lack of sobriety, but rather faithful. Here we must understand that you may say, well, it seems like our salvation with the master's coming is tied to our doing. Oh, please don't misunderstand me, beloved. That salvation is by grace through faith alone. Always. You're not saved by how good you are. You're not saved by your works. You are saved by Christ's work. And in there you find your being, hope and salvation. But it is the obedience and the doing that affirms and declares there is being. Christians who say, I am a follower of Christ, and yet their life does not reflect that in some increasing measure, then how can you say you're a Christian? There are many who say that we are Christians, and yet their lives deny that being, that life inside that is found only by grace through Christ. This servant loves his master, and because he loves his master... He is busy doing his work. There is a slothful servant here in this parable. And he says, my master is delayed. And this servant lives as if the master did not exist. He begins to do what he wants. He begins to beat and mistreat those around him. Indulge all types of inner desires. He lives as if the master doesn't exist and will never return. Ah, He's gone. I don't have to worry. I can do what I want. And sometimes we measure sin by the specific sins we commit. And yet God again and again measures our sin by the state of our heart. That's why the scribes and the Pharisees who externally did not commit egregious sins, quote unquote, and yet their heart was so far from God that Jesus reserved the harshest criticisms for them. If you think you're okay because you haven't done whatever that list is in your mind, do not misunderstand. It is the state of the heart in which that God primarily and foremost looks at. And this wickedness of this servant is not that he committed, quote unquote, the most egregious sin in the book, but rather his heart was far from God. He didn't care about his master. He didn't value his master. And so he lived here as if his master didn't exist showing the ultimate devaluing of the master. The master is not worth my time. There could be no greater personal offense against God. And the result in that consequence is eternal damnation. We are held to account for this life, the realities of heaven and the realities of hell. When we think about hell, it's an uncomfortable topic, and chiefly because there's so many misunderstandings about it. When we look at hell, it is the outpouring of God's perfect wrath. It is not a capricious anger, but it is judicial and personal in nature. It is judicial because, as Romans 1 says, it is the settled wrath of God against those who've committed and broken his laws, but it is also 
personal in nature and that we have offended to the highest degree the very persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these parables outline that. This is personal. Can you think of someone who has personally offended you and how hurtful that is? And how much justice you desire? And yet, let's put that in context. That personal offense and pain that you feel is nothing compared to the personal offense you have committed towards God. When we think about hell, it is the righteous outpouring of anger for all of eternity. And why eternity? Eternity seems like overkill. And yet George Rogers puts it well, righteous anger never rises, never abates. It is always a flood tide in the presence of sin because he is unchangeably and inflexibly righteous. That because sin is present, he must deal with it. And the reason that eternal hell is present is because eternal sin exists within that context. And therefore his wrath must eternally match that in order to eternally declare his own righteousness. R.A. Torrey says, shallow views of sin and of God's holiness and of the glory of Jesus Christ and his claims upon us lie at the bottom of weak theories of the doom of the impenitent. The reason that we don't like the topic of hell and when it doesn't make sense to us is because we have such a shallow view of God and his holiness and glory. And yet if we see how deeply sin has offended God, we would ring out, and we will one day in heaven truly ring out, this is a just punishment. If you put that in human terms, someone who's committed the most egregious crime, we ring out with justice and say, yes, there should be punishment, even significant punishment, in order to declare the value of the worth offended. And hell eternally declares that the value of God is beyond comprehensibility, is it is infinite in nature, and only infinite hell can begin to declare the infinite worth of God. You say, it doesn't sound like a very loving God. Well, let's hold on to that thought and move on to the second parable. The ten virgins and the lesson on expectancy. Here we have the setting of a wedding feast. The wedding feast in the Jewish culture and in many places in the Middle East culture is a two-stage event. The man went to the parents, or the parents even pursued the man. The parents came to an agreement, and there was a promise exchange, a covenant promise between the bridegroom and the bride-to-be. And the marriage at that point was legally made. The bridegroom would then leave, leave his bride with his parents. The marriage was not consummated. He would go and prepare a place for her. He would go and build a house, sow the crops, make sure that he had a place prepared for her. And then at some date when it was settled and the timing was right, the bridegroom would come and announce his return and say, I am ready to take my bride. And then he picks up that bride, not literally, but takes her with him in a great procession of joy and proclamation and then enter into the household for joy and feasting and it would be there where the marriage was actually consummated. In the wedding feast, we see promise, preparation, and consummation. Here the bridegroom has already made his promise. There is a covenant between him and the bride. And now the ten virgins are waiting for that second stage. They're waiting for him to come back. They're waiting for the full realization of that promised wedding event. The bridegroom coming is the keeping of a promise. Now we are presented to ten, five foolish virgins and five wise uh, maybe we could literally translate foolish as uh, dim-witted, stupid. I know some people don't like that word, but the, the word that is used here in the Greek is the word from which we get the English word moron. So you have five, five morons <laughs> and five wise. 
It's interesting as well that Jesus uses ten virgins, ten women. Because in Jewish culture, to begin a synagogue or to have a quorum about certain aspects in Jewish law, you had to have a minimum of ten men. The use of ten women is striking here because Jesus is explicitly giving value to women in a culture where traditionally women were not displayed value. It's a unique choice as Jesus again gives teaching on the inherent value of men and women, of all peoples everywhere, and that God cares about all of them. This actually point was caught by a Syrian theologian. Uh, he was a scholar, a physician. His name was Ibn al tayy from the 11th century. And, and this, is, this is to me even historically fascinating if you think about it. Um, here we are learning in that comment, Ibn al tayy an 11th century Syrian who wrote into this and talked about God's grace and mercy to both men and women. This is almost a thousand years ago. How the gospel once reigned in Syria. And how we learned from our brothers and sisters in the Mideast. And now, for centuries, Syria has been closed to the gospel. And now it's a war zone. But God is opening it back up. And maybe, by God's grace, we're going to have some more Ibn al-Taibs who will come and proclaim the gospel once more. And it's one of the reasons that heritage goes to the nations is to see the church built. Because God loves people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, ethnicity, skin color, and language group. May we be on mission. And this Syrian scholar points out from the 11th century, God's love in a culture for where the woman was not valued. But we have these five morons They did not prepare. They did not prepare oil. Their their torches would have been sticks with um, cloth wrapped around the top and they would have had a flask of oil. They would douse that torch in oil and then they would carry that torch up in front of them. Five wise ones knew that, well, he might delay. May not come exactly on their timing, so they are prepared. Now, from the outside, they looked the same, only the heart was different. From the outside, they wore the same white clothing in preparation for the bridegroom's coming. All young ladies, all virgins, all devoted followers of God, at least on the outside. What could tell their difference? It was the state of their heart. Five virgins so valued And so looked forward and so felt honored by the invitation that they prepared their hearts and lives for his coming. Whereas these other five, eh, it's not a big deal. He'll come on our timing. He's going to meet us on our terms. And so we don't need to prepare. And the oil therefore becomes symbolic of an outward sign of true inward being. A true state of the heart. Now this, this breaks my heart. Because from the outside, they looked the same. And how many Christians, even sitting here, outwardly look the same. And yet inwardly, they are not. They don't care about Jesus. They don't care about his coming. And so when the bridegroom comes, they are not prepared. And Jesus said, truly, truly, many on that day will say, Lord, did we not? And he will say, depart from me. And what does he say? I never knew you. So these foolish virgins, unprepared because their hearts were not in step. And when they finally look and the bridegroom comes, they do everything they can, but it's too late and the door is shut. And they bang on the door. And they say, let us in. And the bridegroom responds and says, depart from me. I don't know you. And those unprepared are cut off from joy. They're cut off from participation in the Lord's return. And so the admonition that Jesus gives is don't be caught unprepared. Ready and prepare your heart now because you do not know the day or the hour. Watch 
Be ready. Expect. The true church of God expects his coming, looks forward to his coming. Do you look forward to meeting Jesus? Are you ready today? I'll get oil tomorrow. I'll find salvation next week. But then he arrives and we're caught unprepared. His return is imminent. I want to make a brief side note because I got so many emails and comments from so many of you last week after I talked about the timing of the tribulation. Um, and, then, and then a number of you said, you didn't tell us where you're at. And you're driving us nuts. What's the answer? Well, well, here's a method to my madness. My goal is to help make you think. And here, here's the great thing. Is that a lot of you were so frustrated that I didn't give a position that you went to God's word yourself and studied it for yourself. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Part of the goal here. Okay, I want you to wrestle with these truths and realities. Not just take my word for it, but get into God's word and say... Well, what is my, how do I understand? How do I follow? And you got to be in God's word. So many of you want to know, do I believe in the tribulation or pre or post? And the answer is, Jesus said, no one knows the hour, not even the. <laughs> you guys are. In all seriousness, we need to be very careful about, again, making secondary issues primary issues. And we also need to take note that Jesus did say, no one knows the time or the hour, so be careful. In debates, squabbling over exact sequence of events, when we are told again and again that it is unknowable. Know that there are brothers and sisters in Christ who have different eschatological doctrine of the last times positions than we do, and yet they still love Jesus. And as we talk about the timing of the tribulation, guess what? I hope it's pre-trib, because then I don't have to go through the tribulation. Very practical. Post-tribulational rapture, and we do go through the tribulation, is a scriptural possibility. Now I will say that Jesus again and again talks so much about it happening at any time, what we call the imminence of his return. I would say scriptural evidence leans in favor of pre-tribulation. But you need to be very careful. Let's continue to unpack God's word and miss out on the admonitions that Jesus gives us in favor of trying to establish sequences that scripture says are unknowable. Watch is the main thing. The main things are the plain things. And the plain things are the main things. Watch and be prepared and are you ready? Third parable. The talents, a lesson on entrustment. That we are entrusted with great favor. Each servant has been given a different portion by the master. Some five talents, one two talents, and one one talent. A talent is roughly equivalent to half a lifetime's wages. So do the math. Whatever you're making right now, times that by the number of talents times that by the number of years that approximate your half of a lifetime, we're talking about millions of dollars. A great demonstration of trust. Each servant has a different portion, but all are equally considered servants. And in the church of God and the people of God, we are entrusted with different amounts of grace, favor, responsibility, and we're held accountable to that. But though each one of us may have different portions of favor bestowed upon us, all of us are called servants equally. And there are some Christians in China and East Africa and North Africa where believers have a lot less than you do, just in terms of physical entrustments, political and freedom entrustments, and yet they are equally servants of God. The main question, however, is what is done with that favor, that grace. 
Two servants use what they have been given and invest while the master is absent. They believe, they love their master, they look forward to his coming and they want to work until he returns. And so they entrust, they live as if the master was present. They've been entrusted with different amounts and they're going to use whatever they have been given to their utmost ability to bring honor to their master and not shame. The master returns. You can imagine the joy. Oh, master, you gave me this, and I so honored and valued you that I worked to show your honor and accumulated even more for your glory, for your honor. And the master responds to both of them. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I'm going to increase your responsibility. Now, here's what's interesting. The one with the five talents gets the same commendation as the one with two talents. Now, throughout history, different Christians have been given different opportunities, different amounts of favor, if you will, and yet equal status before the Lord and equal commendation, well done, good and faithful servant. And both of them get the invitation, enter in and participate in my joy. And if you think of Jesus' prayer in John 17, he says, I am praying these things for my disciples and for my people that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. He wants us to experience and enter into the fullness of participation and relationship with him. But what do you do with what you have been given? Or do we spend the time, oh God, if I only had this, or if I only been given this kind of health, or opportunity to go to that school, or if I only had a church like this, then God, I would do some great things for you. And yet God says, use what I have given. Be faithful with what you have been bestowed. For honor and glory belongs to those who've been faithful with what they've been given. And the wicked servant wasted his grace, scorned the opportunity. He buried his grace. It was a declaration of the worth of the master in his eyes. He's not worth my time and my energies. And maybe you're here this morning. And you haven't accepted Jesus Christ and you haven't given your life to him. The fact that you're here hearing the gospel is another demonstration of grace in your life. And will you waste that grace too? Or will you finally bow the knee and say, Jesus is my Lord and Savior and enter into his joy Every human being has been given a certain level of grace, opportunity. Don't waste it because the consequence is complete separation. Cast into outer darkness, a place that seems to be outside of darkness itself, an empty expanse of the wrath of God. And we go back to that and you say, that doesn't sound loving. Two of the greatest words in the Bible. Though we are dead, though we deserve that hell and condemnation, Ephesians 2 says, but God, he intervened, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, that he wants to give you grace and forgiveness and joy and peace and mercy, not condemnation. And that's why he went to the cross. That is why he took the brunt of the wrath so that we might be hidden in the rock and shielded from the wave that is coming, that day of the Lord. The main question for you, though, is will you bow the knee or will you waste that grace? Because that day of the Lord is coming. It is not an if, it is not a maybe, it is a surety. And believer, don't waste the grace given to you. And if you're here this morning, I'm up here, pastors are up here, you walk down and you say, I need Jesus. So show me from God's word how I can enter into that grace this morning. If you're someone who's been playing the game of Christianity, stop it. Don't do it. You are flirting with eternity. 
And believer, if this gospel is so wonderful, does it not propel you to the world? Should it not propel us to the world? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh God, I plead for the souls here that do not know you. It doesn't matter their background. It doesn't matter what religious faith they have come out of. It doesn't matter their good works. All that matters is they trust in a God who met them the whole way. Not only part of the way, but the whole way. You are coming. May we encourage one another. May we challenge one another. May we not waste the grace that has been given to us. So that when the cry rings out in the voice of the archangel and the bridegroom, you, Jesus, return in glory. May we be found ready. Send us forth in your peace. And in Jesus' name we pray.